This is the NeoBooks call on Monday, November 20th, 2023, uh, right after the weekend of adventures that OpenAI had, uh, which we're sort of talking about a little bit. Who's, who's OpenAI? Uh, what do you mean, who's I, open? I, there's a company I vaguely remember called OpenAI. Yeah, yeah, which may still be alive and may not. They, they may all have abandoned it by, <clears throat> by tomorrow. I have a really hard time remembering, remembering it anymore. <clears throat> Is this like be a goldfish? <laughs> no, not at all. It's like, uh, you know, you've got a gr growing concern. I, so I, I, I have a hard time. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot I don't know about OpenAI. Um, so saying that up front, it's really hard to know, I think, what happened with um, the, you know, stewardship, stewardship for good versus capitalism. It's really hard to tell. The, the battle wasn't lost Friday or Monday. It was lost. If it was lost, it was lost a year ago um, when they kind of productized, accidentally productized chat GPT and then became the darling of tech and, you know, Whenever they made the Microsoft deal, that's when it happened. Mm -hmm. So I have a really hard time now telling whether Microsoft. So in another another conversation, somebody said um, Microsoft is is on my uh, excuse my language on my shit list, um, and even <laughs> more than Meta, Meta or Apple or you know, and they went down the whole list of all the companies that would be on on your lists. Microsoft was number one for that person. Uh, somebody else said, why, <laughs> why, you know, uh, Nadella is doing a pretty good job, um, you know, and Microsoft is doing well and stuff like that. I, so that, that, that reply didn't come from somebody who cares about whether or not there's enclosure or not. So Microsoft is on my list um, because of the enclosure of open source. It's done a, a really amazing expansive job of grabbing open source and clutching it into the embrace of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I, you know, in the olden days, the old Microsoft, um, it did that kind of thing for, for commercial gain and market control and things like that. The new Microsoft, it's, it's a lot more, it's, it's more comfortable influencing um a, a big space like open source mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to tell if it's influencing it and influencing it for the good i mean they're they're investing a ton of money into open source and making it better um or if or if it's enclosure and you know and death it, it's hard to tell so the same thing for me happened this morning you know well microsoft won that round um, and it was uh, another part of that conversation was this is the biggest own goal in history. And it's hard not to believe that it's hard. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, uh, we'll just kill the goose that gold and lay the golden eggs and, you know, and we'll be OK. And it's like Microsoft just swooped in and sucked, sucked up the golden eggs. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. why? Why would you do that? And 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 even if you thought Sam and his and his colleagues were forting your progress towards social good or whatever i think they just made it worse you know whatever they were trying to accomplish so they made it you, like when you say own goal you mean Sutscover? uh the open ai board yeah and now Ilya is like i deeply literally that's the words he said i deeply regret my you know my going along with the board you know so, so, so I was wondering, yeah. who, who, start, who, who started this? Like, what, what were the dynamics among the four board members? <clears throat> I haven't heard that story yet. And that's weird because I, the other three board members don't, they're not kind of known. Yeah, I, I've heard, you know, rumors and speculation. I haven't heard anything that I, I would know. Yeah. The, the closest I heard that made most, the most sense was that Ilya, it was just a, an ego thing with Ilya and Sam. And um, Sam had just it, promoted somebody to basically be either parallel to Ilya or above Ilya or something like that. He just got kind of passed over recently and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Weird stuff's going on. And it is weird stuff. stuff on the outside. <laughs> and, it's going to make really good movies. Yeah, right. 
I, nobody's going to care about whatever that company was that that um, you know. Oh come on! I think when when Skynet takes over, we're going to be really <laughs> curious about the moments when it actually broke, like blossomed into public view, and this will be one of them. Uh, it's going to not be remembered. Oh, because because the robots will have gone back and scrubbed all these it's, memories. No, it's it's kind of like. So this is the the biggest like failure of or the biggest board coup the biggest fa failure board coup since you know the apple board kicked steve jobs out yeah and mm. the three of us here can remember that vividly and tell the yeah. stories of mm -hmm. it and we figured we'd tell our grandkids the stories of it but in the grand scheme of things when you say steve jobs most people in the world don't remember that he got fired you know they remember mm. what happened yeah. after that but I'm not sure mm. that was as momentous as this is in some interesting It, it was not. I yeah. And it's it's striking because it's like, wow. And especially, you know, looking back after Steve was successful again, yeah. you, you know, it's like, that was a really, and that's dwarfed by this. It's just dwarfed. Mm. Very interesting. I had one of the, the weirdest day of my professional life was when I worked for New Science Associates. Uh, and sometime around 1992, one, two, somewhere in there. There were three founders of New Science who had all met at Gartner Group. And uh, one day I'm on the phone with a client and it's 10 a.m. And somebody comes over and says, drop everything. Uh, you make, you know, apologize to your call. Everybody like downstairs. So like, okay, what the hell? So we all go downstairs and two of the three founders are basically saying, um, leave the building, leave the premises, come back at 4 p.m. Uh, your jobs are safe. Don't worry, but we can't tell you anything right now. And so we left mm. and I, I had the, the smart, lucky move of going with the half the sales crew over to one of their apartments nearby. And they pretty much knew what was up. <clears throat> they, they had the inside, the inside scoop. And what happened was that the two of the founders ousted the third. And in the, you know, while we were gone, they changed the locks. They had a, a meeting with the third founder at a local hotel, presented him with papers that said, hey, here's the deal. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we came back at four and and learned most much of this, but not all of it. It was just really bizarre and interesting. And I've never that 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 I guess I'm fortunate that that was the weirdest day of my professional career. <clears throat> but that was a, a really mini palace coup <clears throat> back then. So anyway, short short stories. It's weird but that stuff happened. Yeah, it's really weird. It's it's certainly memorable. Like whoa. Yes. <laughs> and and I can imagine that this being in much more public view for a much larger enterprise is just like crazy making for all the people in there. You know, 550 of the 700 employees threatened to resign unless the board is dissolved. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. Well, the final right. part of that yeah. letter says the board resigns and uh, Sam and Greg are reinstated. And it's like, mm. that's not <laughs> too, too late. For too that late. One. Too, too late, late for that one. Mm. Yeah. And, and this for the company with the fastest growing market of uh, the most interesting new market around, which only last week had to put a governor mechanism on, you know, new sales and new accounts of, of people dying to give it money. It's, it's just, it's, 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 it's shocking. Uh, that right there might, might be part of what made things come to a head. In which sense? I like, mean, there's like 400 pressures that that would have been contributing to, right? Yeah, the one of the rumors that I heard, and granted, it was like the end of last week, I think, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> Ancient but, history. Um, but it was like uh, Ilya's nose was bent out of shape because all the all the GPU you know cycles are getting soaked up by paying customers and not by you know it's like the research staff kind of needs to be able to work here, guys. You know, I don't wow. know what you're doing with this commercial venture. <laughs> <laughs> oh man mm. it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy and 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 interesting and relevant to the stuff we care about the the, the other prediction i'll make about forgotten companies i now it looks like uh, microsoft is uh nadella's company founded by bill whoever and and paul what what's his face i don't know i don't yeah. i don't remember <laughs> <laughs> it's Microsoft, you know, the, the, the company that, that cracked AGI, you know, uh, under the, under the leadership of Nadella and, Alt, and uh, Altman. That's interesting. 
Well, nobody knows why General Motors is called General Motors and United Airlines is called United Airlines. They were General both, Electric. They, they were they were both industry roll ups. There were tons and tons of little players that got squished together. <laughs> So and, no, and, and nobody remembers kind of is. the component parts, right? Nobody remembers. Yeah. yeah. Ah, excitement. Super um, excitement. Well, so just we... on a completely different note, I just Please. caught a little bit about the accolades of Rosalind Carter today. It was yeah. really the little piece. Of, it was what a remarkable woman. Totally yeah. remarkable. Anyway, it's, it's just, you know, I just total in awe of the woman, you know? Anyway, we can put a full stop there, but I just thought I would, you know, the, in a good, little uh, good news. Yes. Good, um, news. good news, good news. Good and sad news, yeah. Yeah, good and sad. I appreciate you bringing that into the yeah. conversation, and there's no reason to stop there for a sec. We can talk about it more. Um, uh, James Fallows was a speechwriter for, I forgot which president first, but he's tracked this a long time and has known the Carters for a long time, so he wrote a a brief piece about Rosalind and uh, it's just really interesting stuff. I mean, I, I, I think Carter is the best ex-president we've ever had and was not a terrible president. Um, no, I agree with you. I yeah. agree. Totally. <laughs> Very weird. Well, it, which actually speaks to, speaks to the, uh, the decline of politics in the United States over the last 40 years and how smearing can be so effective and dark money can, is used not to promote the candidate, but to tear down candidates. And so you have this, you know, toxic brew of just destroying people without elevating others. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, we, we are in a real pickle. And uh, it's going to be fascinating what happens in the next election. Uh, because and also, there's a good chance, there's a good chance that Trump could get in, you know? I mean, you know, there's shenanigans and shenanigans, and they know how to play the game. And Javier Milei just won uh, the presidency of Argentina. Uh, he is a far right, he's, he's calling himself the Trump of Argentina, uh, although... Oh, he won! He, I, he won, he won. Yeah. By, by, by oh, a lot, good, by, good grief. 56 44 or something like that um, wow. percentage of the vote and um one of his first moves is going to be something that i'm kind of not unhappy about which is the dollarization he's going to get rid of the argentine yeah so he's going to do what yeah, panama, what yes, panama what there's a couple of countries that that are fully dollarized i've forgotten which ones panama is one of them there's a few others but he's going to like get rid of the peso and the central bank and whatever else that means and i'm like whoa I lived there as a kid and I went back as an adult for a project and I I have I have a bag of million dollar uh, million peso notes. I, I have mm. I have like I don't know, I have no idea if they're worth anything, but I'm not a bag. I've got a good clutch of million peso notes that got replaced by thousand peso notes when they chopped zeros off the currency one year. And you had to turn in mm. your your old notes and like, you know, get them get them replaced kind of thing. Then they went to the Austral. Which was a replacement currency. Then they said, "Screw the Austral," went back to the peso. It's all nuts. Yeah, there was a very interesting uh, coverage of the election, pre-election coverage, on Amapur, and um, you know, I mean, if if there were one thing that you could identify that tipped the balance, because he he his antics and his, I, I didn't follow it closely, but just what was portrayed on TV, um, you know, he is. Um, <laughs> Trump-like, very flamboyant. He's very evocative. Uh, he knows how to charge people up emotionally. And I'm just wondering whether that one issue alone was the turning point of bringing economic stability, the promise of economic stability to their inflation. Anyway, not that yeah. I know much about Argentina, but it was just interesting. Yep. Anyway, um, thank you for that. Second topic. Shall we head to neo books for a bit? Yes. And I don't know. Sounds good. I, I thought Klaus might be here, but I, I, he must be on the move or something. And Stuart. Um, but let's just roll roll into the into the neo books a bit.
um, where, which part of NeoBooks should we like, since it's us three, what, what's the best part of it to tackle? I, I, I'll go. Um, uh, I, I would have to say my main interest with NeoBooks is, uh, like the technical production part. Um, uh, and, uh, and at least knowing that we have, um, what we, what in Silicon Valley, we used to call marketing and distribution going on. So, um, uh, I, I don't know if I have more to say, say about that. I've definitely got ideas about, uh, um, technical production process, um, uh, and um, and I want to know that that marketing and distribution is going on. But other than that, I guess I don't have a big uh, question for you. Uh, Pete and I were on a call last week with a different group uh, that includes some of our, our friends from multiple projects through OGM and such, which was working on sort of things around AI. But one of the presenting projects was uh, an edited volume of contributions from people because one of the people on the call who's sort of, sort of convened the call has a small press, a small vanity press or publishing house or the capacity to basically turn out books. Um, and, and just Pete, do you have any thought that that would be a useful or interesting thing for us to use for Neo books? Or should we just like plot our own little path and keep going? Uh, her, her press in particular or... Yeah, uh, specifically the offer she made to, hey, I can help people like make books and put them out there. And I, I, I'm like, I think I underestimate how much we might need help like that, but. I don't know, I've been there, done that. Um, I own Stonyfield Press and it's published Kindle books. So. Oh. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's, uh, she, the, she followed it on by saying, you know, and, and once you guys see how easy it'll it'll be, you'll, you'll have your own press. Um, yeah. The, the mm -hmm. process of getting a book uh, into ship shape for Kindle is, you know, and whatever you want to do to call it a press or whatever, um, mm -hmm. not that big of a deal. Cool. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's on the order of getting it on the web or getting it into PDFs or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is an interesting part there um at least back when i did this was a, a while ago um you didn't need an an is been for you know I, amazon cares about an asin and they don't care about it been at all <laughs> um but uh i i also went through the process of getting an isbn number um for you know the, the couple books that i was working on um that that was at least back this was a while ago you know it was it wasn't hard or anything, but it was more involved than I, I thought. I guess maybe it was mostly the money. It was mm -hmm. a, a fair chunk of change to to hmm. register it. That was the that that's the thing that stands out in my mind. The other thing that actually stands out in my mind back in back when I was doing that, uh, I use I ended up using Microsoft Word as the um, publishing tool or, or the the typesetting tool. Maybe is hmm. a better way to say it. Um, I don't, I don't know. It, it's probably much cleaner and better now than, and you'd probably don't need to use Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then also separately, completely, Pete and I, him doing the technical stuff, tried to take uh, Klaus's manuscript and turn it into uh, some markdown, which is the, and Rick, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but the idea is um, I'm writing in Markdown, but uh, Stuart and uh, Klaus are writing in Google Docs. Uh, and we could try to go from Google Docs into some sort of publishing, you know, EPUB uh, uh, direction. Mm -hmm. But the conceit of NeoBooks is that we break the, the books down into nuggets or chap you know, chapters, then nuggets, sort of subchapters that roll up into the book as published. Mm -hmm. And so Pete and I spent some time trying to export um, uh, the Google Doc as a series of markdown pages and ended up hitting a bunch of mysterious format marks that we need to figure out, you know, basically trap and change or trap and use, uh, and a few other things that are going to have to happen. But we had we got a little bit of uh, mileage on what that's going to look like. 
the just the mm -hmm. conversion the conversion process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Rick, I think you're you're in Google Docs as well, right? I, I do use it, not that that much actually, but I do use it. Yeah. What's your general writing tool then? Word. Uh, actually, Substack now. I'm, I've been using Substack, and I just I just go straight in there. Um, you know, last week we spoke about this a little bit, and uh, you know, one of the things that um, I was curious to you know, because a couple of sessions ago I asked you to sort of like give a pitch of what Neo Books is, um, and uh, I think you've already established a Substack presence sort of thing for Neo Books. The question is what to do with that. Um, and I actually, I think the idea of, of, you know, what I proposed last week of, you know, you can share a, uh, a pre-draft publication uh, of something, bring it to this and to other meetings for that matter, um, and get feedback on it. And then when you do publish it, then you get people to, you, you announce people that it's being published. So you begin to get um, people coming to it and you can cross references on other things like LinkedIn and whatever. But I think you really need to have a, a sort of, um, and I'm not, this is not my expertise. This is just the ideas, but having a st sort of strategic approach about how you get the word out. I mean, writing a book is a relative easy, easy thing to do, relatively easy thing to do. The question is, does it get anywhere? And, and it's 90% marketing. And if you don't have a, a, a well thought out strategy about that, you know, you can have the best, best message in the world, but you know, it, 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 if it's not heard, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and so one of the things that I, I'm curious about is where, how this may evolve within this group about how to use Substack. Um, and I mean, there are other people within your group who use Substack and write in it. Um, but how do you create a sort of mycelium network? So you have a hub, like, and then you have people like myself who are doing things. And occasionally, I could do a you know a guest article in there, and you and you start um, you know crowdsourcing it. Now, one thing that I didn't realize, and uh, you know, this gets into the algorithms of, of publishing on sites, is that they do track things. So, like on LinkedIn, if you get a lot of you know views and comments within the first hour or two it tends to get amplified. Uh, so unless you know the names of the games on these various platforms, which is not my area of expertise, then, um, you know, I don't know if there's anybody within your group who understands this uh, effectively, but, you know, there is, um, you know, you have to know how these things operate if you're trying to get any message out. Um, thanks, Rick. That makes a lot of sense. I, I wonder for this group, um, how we, how much we want to do um, uh, whatever I, I, I I'm thinking of the term SEO but it's not SEO um, whatever kind of uh, strategic marketing you do I wonder how much mm -hmm. this group actually wants to do that to, to try to game the algorithms um, on the one hand um, gaming you know if, if you've got a good message and Klaus is, is, you know, a good example, you know, more, more people mm -hmm. should hear Klaus. Um, is it, um, is it, is it the right thing uh, to join in with, you know, essentially commercial marketing techniques uh, and, um, you know, dopamine stealing market techniques and uh, uh, algorithm gaming techniques, you know, is that the right, is that the right thing to do? For the better good is it um it feels a little bit uh wrong to me um it feels a little bit right too i mean i'm not complaining um in in some perfect world there i i in, i guess i guess i wish that in some perfect world that there was a little bit more organic way to do it um mm -hmm. so instead of tricking the algorithm into pr promoting you better um it would be more like uh real people going wow this uh you know this message needs to get seen by more people and i'm going to use my network to you know to help mm -hmm. with that i don't know so there's a yeah. lot of energy we could pour into distribution or awareness building before we be i mean we could spend a whole a whole bunch of effort doing fruitful um, organic marketing before getting to SEO, even though I agree with you that SEO is the place most people go. Sorry, Rick, go ahead. 
No, no, no. I, I, I concur with you. I, I share that ambivalence, and it's sort of um, a question of you know, it's like anything. Um, you know, what's the integrity of marketing? And you know, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. <clears throat> uh, most of it's bad and ugly. Uh, but the question is, how can you how how can you raise to a level of ethical marketing? And the thing is, you can't control the systems that you engage with. So that um, I don't see it as, as necessary manipulating the algorithms. It's more a question of understanding the manipulation that's already gone into the algorithms, so that you know that you're not at a disadvantage. Um, so you know, it's it's the serenity prayer. You know, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. And and the yeah. question is, if you do go out in there, how can you do it with a sense of ethics, which I am totally and utterly, uh, you know, behind. And I, I've picked up on some of your sentiments on that area and the sort of conundrum of balancing between, you know, doing things in a purist manner versus being pragmatic, given the fact that's the reality of the world, such as Substack, you know. Substack yeah. isn't necessarily, you know, the best, but, you know, it's, it's the one that I, I've seen, what I'm looking at, I'm saying, this looks as though it's got potential. Um, and I mean, for example, I said this feedback once before, way back when I first started attending, you know, everything that you're doing at the moment, and I've said this to other groups, there's so much good stuff that goes on within the walls of that, you know, group. But why not make it public? I mean, why not, why not use Substack, everything? I mean, the videos and stuff like that, you know, pick out the ones and just, you know, uh, you know, put it out there to see whether you can actually snowball things and, 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 you know, cherry pick the things that you decide to put on there. So if, if somebody does like, for example, uh, one thing that I'm interested in is how to make more effective uh, collaborative learning platforms. And, you know, if there's an inverted, you know, classroom technique of where you prime it up with a brief, an article, a brief video thing that may be five minutes, come to the Zoom thing, you know, get involved in a, a large group, small group, you know, um, dialogue things. How can you, you create that sort of um, uh, organic learning community? Um, and that's what I'm interested in is, you know, you know, if we're, if we're going to take on the dark side, we've got, to, we've got to have some pretty sophisticated light to be able to take it on. Yeah. Nicely put. Um, so the idea of taking excerpts from our different rhythmic calls and posting them through Subtac had never occurred to me and is a good idea. Um, and I'm like, well, gosh, okay. I hadn't, hadn't really thought about that. I, I post them all to YouTube and then forget about them. And the time it takes yeah. to go back and clip an excerpt is time I don't have, so don't take. Um, and I'd be really interested, you know, at the end of every call, if people had time markers for the beginning of some note, noteworthy thing that was said or done on that particular call, it'd be super interesting to be able to easily go back and, and you know, harvest those and use them well. That'd be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, is I don't know what uh, open global mindset is. Is it just a an, you know a loose association? Is it you know is it an entity? Is it nonprofit? I mean, what is what is the status of it? There are a couple of entities. So OGM is a community of practice that has no legal structure. Then there is a tiny thing uh, called, I'm even forgetting what we called it, uh, but is a is basically a fiscal sponsee of Lionsburg. Um, and it was called OGM capsule? No, OGM something or other. Basically a little, a little floating thing so that OGM could receive uh, money as a nonprofit because as a fiscal sponsee of an actual non of a registered nonprofit, you could do that. And then um, well, that's, that's most of the legal structure. Yeah. Well, the reason why I bring that up is because uh, if you do have a nonprofit structure, um, I'm sure you're familiar with tap roots, but you know, if, if you have an enter, if you have something, once this gets better developed and, and you get buy-in about the notion of, of neo books that um, that can be organic, evolving. There'll be products, different ways of doing things, creating communities. Um, then you know that might attract uh, people from you know you can you can apply to Taproot to ask for volunteers for very specific things that you need assistance with. Hmm. Um, and um, you know, I mean, it all comes down to 
You know, what resources can you harness and align in a way that can uh, advance the cause, really? Thank you, and thanks for reminding us of the Tapper Foundation. Oh, oh, yeah. The one thing is, the other thing is, last time we did speak about what's the governance of near books. I mean, I think that should be part of the dialogue as well. I mean, if you think about what happened with, not that I know anything about it, open AI, you know, there was obviously interpersonal dynamics. They didn't get their governance stuff sorted out. You know, there was obviously, you know, you know, they hadn't done their pre-work to anticipate some of the, you know, inevitable things that might emerge given the fact it was growing so rapidly. Um, so I, I think putting energy into, uh, into that. So, um, you know, one thing you could do potentially here is that somebody could, you know, do a blog post and do a pre, you know, pre review of it. So you send it to people in advance, you discuss it and then think about, okay, what would this, you know, what would this look like on that? Or if somebody had something they wanted to put that they wanted to promote through that. So, you know, people can have their own things. They can, they can do a lead article in within OGM or they can have, you know, so how are you creating a network of people um, that, you know, connect with each other around the different, you know, areas of interest. Um, and that's partly why I started with the question about is what happened to OpenAI uh, damaging to the future of steward ownership? Because we were uh, sort of um, led in some sense by uh, Jordan Sukut. We were heading towards steward ownership with a little flotilla of, of organizations that wanted to do something like that. And uh, so I'm, 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 looking for evidence of, you know, whether what's happened right now is good or bad for that kind of organizational structure or what else it means. Because it, it looks like that organizational structure will be flushed out of OpenAI and its successors like by next week. Because I, I think that I think that what the employees are demanding is the firing of the board and the restructuring of the company. And I don't know what new form it's going to take, but, but but it feels like they had this attempt to do steward ownership that didn't go well. It was, it was poorly, I, I mean, I, who am I to talk? I mean, you know, there were, there are large forces at work, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's steward ownership that, that it, that's called into question. I think it's the, you know, the operation of the board, uh, over the past probably year and a half, at least maybe two years. Um, they've, you know they had the opportunity to to handle things much better over the, the past year uh, none of none of this past year has been a surprise you know after after the first week of ChatGPT, it was not i i you know i i'm i would they should not have been surprised by anything that unfolded so they've had a year to get off their duff and you know figure out what they wanted and make it happen um and instead what happened is somehow in the, in the course of a week, uh, you know, interpersonal stuff and money stuff and God knows what, um, you know, it exploded uh, like a firecracker in their hands. So hey, it's, I, the, it's an interesting, it, it will be an interesting case study, but not, it doesn't have much to do with anything, you know, any, any kind of governance stuff that we care about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, and part of, Part of that is, is you know, it's just funny because for some reason last night I was watching PBS and whatever. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, they were doing an appeal for money, whatever. I mean, a model like PBS where it's clearly, you know, it has shifted and changed over time. But it, if it's really, um, it, if the enterprise is really in the common good, et cetera, common cause, whatever, then, you know, trying to sort out the governance of that process, I think is criti critically important um as a um anti-capitalist force to everything else that's going on um so and we have good examples of that um i i would in in that category i would nominate wikipedia um uh, mm -hmm, and right. um yeah. the mm -hmm. mozilla foundation um mm -hmm. uh, we linux talk foundation to, maybe linux foundation we could talk to brian bellendorf mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we could probably talk to people at wikipedia um I, you know, and, and I, I'll, there's a lot of complaining uh, too about Wikipedia or um, the Linux Foundation or the Mozilla Foundation, but it didn't blow up either. <laughs>
And Wikipedia is still, as far as I know, within the top 10 most trafficked websites and the only one that doesn't use cookies or et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that it's got there and has stayed there despite a whole series of setbacks and difficulties is impressive. It's incredible. The the amount of um, the, the, the depth and kind of the breadth of the bureaucracy underneath, you know, Wikipedia Foundation and then out to all the volunteers and all the um, language specific Wikipedias is breathtaking. I think that that whole thing there is it's it's amazing that anything works at all, I think. Um, and um, I have my complaints about the way Wikipedia works, but you know, taken as a whole, I think it's a, a I, I think it's a shining example of of hu humans working together in you know in ways that that we don't typically work together at scale. It's it's really remarkable. Remarkable. Do you have any connections? Do you have any connections with with them? I mean, in some respects, what you're describing is a, there's a parallel process there in terms of thinking about. Um, you know, the, the function would be different here, but it's really about creating interactive learning communities rather than going to Wikipedia, you know, for specific things that you're looking for. Yep. Um, and so it's, it becomes a dynamic Wikipedia, so to speak, mm -hmm. of learning communities around things because, you know, I mean, people, put, you know, the, the nice thing about, you know, you probably know the history of temporary, but, you know, the reason why it came into being was that people like to volunteer for things they love to do. I mean, duh, and and their job was you know, interesting. So I, I, I want to donate my time to something I really you know feel good about. Yeah. Well, if you can tap into that uh, into that force and take it to scale, uh, so that you actually invert it, so that capitalism is is on the sideline, and you have a flourishing you know learning community around it. That's that would be sweet. It would be sweet. I know, yeah, one little factoid that I didn't appreciate until I heard it um, was that during the Renaissance, they, they used to play a lot. They had 120 days a year where they did things for fun. I mean, imagine if, if, you know, life could be that you only had to work two days a week and you had the rest of the week to do whatever you want, you know? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? That'd be awesome. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? That's what I'm doing now. I'm just working. I'm just working two, two and a half days a week now. So anyway, I'm living the life I wish I'd had at the beginning of my career. <laughs> Way to go! Excellent. Yeah, Jerry. I wonder what your goal, uh, your your personal goals for new books are. Um. So a couple different things. One is I. I think this is an interesting experiment in the future of media and how ideas float around the world. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to be mm -hmm. prototyping that. So I'd like to play an active role mm -hmm. in prototyping it. If I saw that someone else had done this and done this well, I'd be like joining them. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say let's, let's yeah, right. some neo books. And I think that pieces of what we're doing have been done in other places, but I don't, I don't see it sort of set up yet. So that's one thing. Another thing is I want to write one or more neo books. I've had a I've had I had a book disaster in 2000. Um, I've got at least one, maybe three books in me anyway, uh, without doing primary research, and I'm just trying to facilitate getting them out of my head and into nuggets that can be rolled up into some neo books as we learn how to do the process. And then third, I think that the the first thing I said has a bunch of knock on effects that are kind of like what Rick was just talking about, which is communities of practice, learning communities, just play and mm -hmm. community and thinking yeah. together and a, a bunch of other things. And my my larger goal is to help humans make better decisions together. And I think a piece of that is just about the ongoing sharing of what we believe and why. And, and I think that that's mm -hmm. feasible, or at least we can get closer to it uh, by doing things like neobooks. So that that's a piece mm -hmm. of it, and there's there's probably motivations that you've seen or imputed to me that uh, that I haven't verbalized or made aware myself. And if so, let me know because um, I'm I'm really interested. And so, thank you for the question. 
What's which, which where's your passion highest? If you were to pick one book, what what is the what is the one that you're most drawn to uh, to pursue first? Uh, well, the one I'm the one I'm working on right now as part of Neo Books is uh, a design from trust. Basically, what is it? Uh, it's a different mm-hmm. pro- book from the one I was trying to write before, but related. Um, and that that's kind of I, I just want to get the idea in the world in some practical mm-hmm. practical way. By the way, did you did you have a chat with Daryl Stickley? You know the guy who uh, were you able to chat with him? We did. Um, oh, good. And thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm trying to remember where we went with it. Um, I will. It'll it'll come back to me. But, but uh, yeah, it's okay. No, but he, he's written a book about it, and he's actually, yeah. you know, he, he's actually working with people about that. He, he's a. I don't know if you realize, but um, uh, he, he may not have mentioned to you, but he's blind. And uh, he's yeah. got a, a very interesting history. Um, yeah. And uh, anyway, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But uh, so, no, what about you, Pete? What What's your What's your yeah. uh, Do you have have one? Do you have something that uh, rises to the top, calling you? I I, I unfortunately have like ten things that rise to the top, <laughs> or or twelve. Um. Very literally, I mean, I've I've got, I've got kind of ADD. Um, with Neil Books, I'm interested in. Um, I you know there's I I have I, the the good the good news I guess is uh, at least for me I can see ways that all of my different interests and projects uh, interrelate. Um, mm-hmm. So. Uh, so I'm interested in the technical publishing process for new books. Um, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, I'm also interested in collaborative writing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, new books, I, I've got another project called Prose Fusion, where I'm exploring the writing process, just the writing process. New books is a little mm-hmm. bit more about the publishing process and the mm-hmm. you know, nuggetization and stuff like that. Um, but they they go together, they they synergize, mm-hmm. and then right. both of those things synergize with Massive Wiki. Um, there's also uh, a new thing coming out of the dis- discussions with Neo- about Neo Books, um, uh, the Massive Wiki, um, uh, the Massive Wiki version of email newsletters and and nuggets. Um, mm-hmm. So when when we talked about you know should it be Ghost or Substack, it's like there's this third thing that uh, looks like you're using Ghost or Substack, except that you're probably actually using something more like Massive Wiki, mm-hmm. um, and then it's hooked to email. There's there's not much, um, you know, there's there's not much. Uh, technology that needs to make it so that you could have a massive wiki version of ghost or substack the, the, mm-hmm. the technical part at least not the marketing part of substack um i don't know i'm i'm interested in uh um i i i probably actually would be interested in writing some new books too i i have a bunch of like pieces here and there scattered all around and would love to collect them up and get them out Um, One theme that I've, I've heard you speak about, and I don't know whether it fits into that, but it actually um, you know, reflects some of the things you've already said, which is this interface, so to speak, between um, capitalism, so to speak, and social good or social impact. And even your, your questions about um, you know, using the even substack, you know, the, the, the sort of hesitancy about you know, that or how to gain the the algorithm, so to speak. And to me, that comes back to the ethics and integrity of what you're trying to do, which uh, often gets so shortchanged. And, uh, you know, uh, interesting enough, I'll just go off. I was involved in a group. I won't go into the details of it, but somebody triggered me and I thought, okay, 
Um, I, I, I want to write a blog about this. And I'll just tell you the title of it. Let me just pull it up here. Um, the title of it is, it, How Might the Phoenix of the Grand Old Party, GOP, Resurrect the Eisenhower Virtues of Democracy from the Authoritarian Ashes of Trumpism? Uh, and, great, I, great you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I, but to me, I, I write with questions, you know, to evoke things, you know, and... Um, so uh, and and so I, I I did a little you know chat GP thing. What are Eisenhower's principles of democracy and you know whatever? And then did this and this and whatever. And I just you know churned it out last night. And then oh, I'll show you the let me show you the image that I got from Dolly, which is I'll, I'll see if I can quickly share it. Maybe if I can here. There we go. That's that's the image that came. I don't know if you can see that very well. Yep. Uh, let me get that out. Yeah. Uh, that was the image that was generated. And I put details in. I thought, yep, that's the image. <laughs> that's a good one. The, the Phoenix yes. needs to be tearing Trump limb from limb, just a personal preference. <laughs> but well, 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 actually, Mid Journey could probably turn that into a movie so that you could actually see the, the Phoenix devour. It could be a vulture, actually, rather than the Phoenix. Anyway, I couldn't, uh, but actually, it's amazing what you can do. And I'm just, I'm a neophyte. I mean, I've I've only done you know maybe a dozen of these things so far. But anyway, I thought I would just share something that uh, I'll stop sharing there. But um, <clears throat> you know, doing short things like that where it, it's it's a little bit more sophisticated than clickbait, but it's actually leading to substance rather than just getting your attention to manipulate. Um, you know, yeah. for whatever ul 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 ulterior purpose that people have when they, you know, use these platforms. But um, but anyway, that's the one thing I was intrigued by is your your deliberations, which I've noticed several times about that tension between, you know. There, but there, that that could be an article. That could be an article. I mean, that could yeah, be a very nice you. article. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is going to sound weird to say, but I think the the ethics part of that is actually secondary to uh, kind of the um, the the thing I'm interested in is structural mechanics of humanity, um, mm -hmm. and the the way that we the way that we've got into the hierarchical and capitalist uh, you know model is just mm -hmm. it, it's it's bad for a lot of people, bad for almost everybody. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, so kind of everything I do is centered around the idea of decentralization and distribution mm -hmm. and, um, you know, flat uh, inter uh, interlocking um, uh, society, societies, small, much smaller societies working together uh, for common good. And, and out of that, you know, it come the questions of, so would you use open source or closed source? Would you use, you know, um, a capitalist system or a not capitalist system? And so then I, I, another set of interests that I didn't really go into are organizational structures around um, decentralized small, um, small groups, um, decentralizing, but also being able to coordinate. Um, mm -hmm. So Massive Wiki is a tiny part of that. Um, I've talked with Jordan Sukut and David Bull about other kinds of organizational structures, uh, or, or organizational structuring is maybe a better way to say it, to get you know more decentralization. Um, you know, it's funny because I would go ahead. Just to go back to what Peter was saying earlier, um, it reminded me that one of my motivators is also to help Pete and Massive get to where they could be. Um, because Pete and I share a lot of, I think, um, vision of what what the possibilities are and how this all kind of works together. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's you know what we're going to do right now pragmatically is hopefully several of us will go write blog posts on Substack. Then we'll probably copy those posts out and put them into Markdown files so that they're available as nuggets within the the massive ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. but it should be the other way around. It should be, we should be writing these things as markdown files and then just press a button so that massive can act like Substack, as Pete was describing. And the same <clears> thing, the, the same things end up happening, except the other way around mm -hmm. and, and, and be, pretending to be Substack and pretending to be a book 
and actually being a wiki and actually being a discussion platform and all those kinds of things are all the mm -hmm. kinds of rich features that it would be lovely to, to, to see grow and happen. Mm -hmm. Well, just it's, another idea, because I was just... I think violin I should have listening. broken in right about then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Was majestic. Thank Go you. ahead. Yeah. With a, no, with a crescendo. It, <laughs> I was just uh, listening to Lex Friedman's uh, podcast, uh, for the, and uh, he's he's got this gentleman on who is... Uh, a political scientist that I hadn't heard of before, but it, it ties into what you're talking about decentralization. And he talks about power and um, how anarchy gives rise, is non hierarchical and gives rise to hierarchy. And his whole premise of everything he's talking about, I diametrically oppose to. And here is a sophisticated political science talking about power. And so, you know, if there is a sort of person, who you diametrically disagree with, which is a great learning place, because then you can start articulating your arguments more co coherently. And, you know, so for example, if as part of this learning community, uh, that there would be a podcast you cite, that you listen to in advance, and you come prepared in advance to, you know, get into the substance of what the person and where you disagree with. Because uh, he talks about realist and liberalism, the three schools of liberalism and the different schools of realist and how they look at power. Um, and I disagreed with the way he was talking. Um, and I'm thinking this guy spent a career studying dysfunctional political systems. And, you know, what, what if we actually de design things that weren't based upon fear and domination, yada, yada, you know, duh. <laughs> so, that, anyway, that's part of the I mean, that would be, an, yeah. Time. Yeah. Well, exactly. It, 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 and it's it, you. You have to have the trust. You have to eliminate fear. You have to allow people to have the space to be generative, joyful, and have fun together, uh, opposed to all this, um, you know, um, toxic divisiveness. I mean, it's just it's escalated, and and there is there needs to be a counter force to this. And how low do we have to get before we discover it? Are we just going to tear ourselves apart? You know, it's just, anyway. Uh, thank you. Anyway, you might want to look at that. Yeah, you might want to look at it. Um, you know who the... I, I, yeah, I'm just, let me just see if I can find it here. His name is John Mershenshimer. Yeah. Yeah, Mershenshimer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, I mean, he's he's very articulate, you know, and, uh, but I, just the very opening of his thing, I'm, he was downgrading anarchy, you know, as though that was a negative. Well, of course it can be. You have to define what it means. It means decentralized pair, power, people are self-organized, self-generating, whatever. Then you can get rid of the stupid hierarchies that gets us into all these pickles. You know? Good Lord. Is it the three minute and 26, three hour and 26 minute podcast? John Mearsheimer. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it really? is. It's a, God, and actually, a half hour. I, I, I know. Well, I've only, I'm only about an hour into it, but you know, I mean, that's, that's the problem with these long formats, but I must admit, I do like the way he interviews people. He does it from a position of humility. Unlike, you know, some of the, uh, the right wingers who, who come from incredible hubris. You know? Oh yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Great, Scott. like Joe Rogan and and Gordon Peterson and all these, you know, uh, you know, super the mega stars of the social media sphere. And that's the era we're in, right? This second, it's totally. I true. know exactly. It's totally, true. and it's just triggering a triggering amygdala and reptilian brains. That's all it's about. And that's the and what you just said earlier about how do we counteract that is crucially mm -hmm. important right now. Like crucial. Exactly. I mean, there's connections in everything we're saying here, because the issue of trust, you don't have trust, you've got nothing. If you can't, if you don't have safety and trust, then threat and fear is going to dominate and you're going to regress to survival mode and you're never going to have the resources to be able to handle conflicts. But weirdly, threat and fear also have trust models around them. Like you can, if you can trust somebody to be fair about the use of violence, then 
there's a form of trust there. So my favorite, and you also mentioned a moment ago, like having people with really different opinions. One of my favorite sort of jousting partners that way is my sensei at my dojo, whose name is Ty Barker, and he's very libertarian. Uh, he would have us all basically live like Sparta and, you know, compete up the hierarchy <laughs> and uh, learn, you know, learn weapons and and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And and he, he thinks open carry is just fine, no problem, and a bunch of other stuff that I don't I don't want to live in a society where I'm walking down the street watching people pack heat. Like that that would make me mm -hmm. leave. I, I would feel mm. I would feel um I shouldn't speak because I've never walked down a street like that. I mean I mean the closest mm. I've been is maybe having been in Tel Aviv at one point and seeing some people with uh submachine guns, you know, strapped on. I think that might be it. Um, but still, th th there's visions of that that make no sense to me. And but trying to articulate that and compare notes really works for me. It's very, it's a uh, yeah. Really oh, absolutely. Super interesting. Yeah. Uh, you just triggered a little association by what you're describing there. I, I remember uh, a GP named uh, Mickey Weingartner who was from Tel Aviv, and I was in Hong Kong. This is several decades ago. And he invited me to eat some kosher food at the Jewish Center in Hong Kong. And apparently it's a very small community. So as we're, as we're going into the restaurant, um, you know, they're doing security checks, you know, looking in our bags and whatever. And, and I, said to, I said to Mickey, I said, isn't it sad that you have to go through this? And he said, good grief. I wouldn't go into a restaurant in, unless they had that. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, his way of life was such that it was so, I mean, you know, talk about creating a, a an atmosphere of safety. If that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. But it was, I remember that so vividly when he said that to me, I thought, thought you know, I came in with my worldview and he just, sh you know, shattered my worldview with his worldview. And I thought, wow. And I'm yeah. I'm sitting here yeah. wrestling with whether I actually ever want to know how many people in the restaurants I have actually been to were packing heat. Mm -hmm. That I did that I didn't know about that, that I didn't realize yeah. we're, we're carrying. And it's like mm -hmm. it's probably a lot. It's probably a whole bunch. Just one last thing. I did speak with uh, Kent Langley, uh, and he remembers you very well, Jerry. So um <clears throat> he spoke well of you. Thank you. So anyway, I I I, I I, I, I thought, I said, would you be willing to come to one of these sessions to explain what you're doing with your book box? And he was open to the idea. So it probably oh. won't happen until, you know, sometime in the future. I, I'll, ju I'll just find out when he might be available because he's been thinking long and hard about, um, you know, how to use books in a much more interactive way. And they've got, I think the last time I spoke to you, uh, mentioned the, um, the MTP Genius uh, chat. Uh, app that he's developed where you can go in and you can ask, you know, Salim, uh, Ismail, what, you know, info, you know, questions about exponential organizations. So that might be a good link. But I think the power will be the power of the network is how can you link up with lots of different other people who share the common vision and, um, you know, harness the uh, what I call empowerment networks, mm -hmm. not network power, empowerment networks. Um, and I think that's what we have to work towards if we're going to have decentralized power. We have to design things to empower people. Um, that's really interesting. And it would be fun to hear from Kent what he's what he's up to. Um, it would fit really well our conversations here. Huh. And he was uh, the EXO community, the exponential organization community has its own token that's been about to be monetized for about four years now <clears throat> and i don't mm -hmm. i don't think it's uh, i don't think it's ever turned into something valuable but uh but yeah yeah i, I you know there's some th there's an element to what they're doing which to me is too um how shall i put it too capitalist so to speak because it's really built within the corporate mindset so to speak on the other hand you can't deny the reality of corporations and there are some ones out there who are trying to do good stuff, even though you may not entirely agree with the model. But then it becomes, well, you know, who from that side can you uh, collaborate with in ways that uh, can harness the power, you know, conscious capitalism with social impact, you know? Which is a great and hot question these days. And I'm, I've been 
I've been morbidly fascinated to watch the backlash against woke companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, three years ago, if a company wasn't taking a stand, two, two years ago, if a company wasn't taking a stand on important social issues, you were like, hmm, what's up with you people? And right now, if they do, they're going to get, you know, backlash like crazy. And it's, it's crazy making for the companies, I think. Um, but to me, I'm always really interested in the lash and backlash of history. The, that, that, that part of history just rivets me. <clears throat> so, you know, when, when people, when reactionaries basically have their way um, and change society back or towards some new warped place, I, it, it's fascinating. And I mean, to me, that speaks to the dysfunctional polarization that vacillates back and forth with, you know, backlash, revolution, counter-revolution, yada, yada. And, and to me, one of the critical things is, well, how can you, you know, move beyond those polarities and think about tripolarity multiple so that you're actually moving in a direction that's, you know, the middle ground, so to speak, without, you know, teeter tottering to the extremes. And I think I think that's the challenge. Yeah. It's interesting, just in the narrower context of Argentina, it feels like Argentina has been teeter tottering between two completely dysfunctional political variants, basically. Uh, Peronism and uh, crazy ass far right uh, stuff, and uh, and they 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 seldom, if ever, pass through any kind of healthy like possible way to organize society. It's very it's it's really uh, heartbreaking. And that's one of the reasons um, why I'm interested in, interested in equity governance, which is how to navigate between them. Because if you put equity along with you know a, a constellation of other virtues if you can if you can push equity forward in terms of fairness negotiated yada yada um it could it could help the ex reduce the extreme vacillations but we mm -hmm. don't have the language to do it very well because we get trapped in the AD, add world of social media and uh it just you know makes things worse um, one thing I'm thinking, uh, gosh, for the Mearsheimer, uh, Friedman podcast, for example, we can put it in doc snip or whatever it's called. Uh, the thing that basically harnesses the transcript and marries it up to the video. So you could then search through the transcript. You could then probably feed the transcript and have it summarized back by chat GPT which might be interesting. I already set up a GPT with the transcript in it. Really? Well, how about that? <laughs> um, although it, it didn't, it, it didn't work. Um, oh. Let me, let me show you real quick. Intriguing, please. That's great. Um, I think it's this one. It, it didn't work in an interesting way. So here's the transcript. It's about 33,000 words, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of funny uh, Taipora's guess at how long that would take to read is I think it was about 90 minutes so mm -hmm. um, anyway I you know this I, I borrowed this from the the uh, Thursday OGM call um, GPT I did it's just kind of generic mm -hmm. um, it's funny how I misspelled that um, so it it did something interesting, and this is interesting from the the aspect of G, chat GPT and GPTs, not the content, but um, it's actually doing just a simple text search here. And so it wrote some Python code <laughs> to open the transcript, and then it's doing a, a search for society and structure um, in the chunks of the transcript. Um, so somehow the the file didn't run properly, so it tried it again, and mm. it, it kind of gave up at some point. Um, so I I may keep on working with this. We'll we'll see. I'm I'm actually super intrigued to see that this is this the, this is not sophisticated at all. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I you know I've written similar code actually for the similar purpose. <clears throat> That's super interesting. You, yeah, it. but. Um, but yeah, you you could 
it it would be a good transcript to play with. If you get it working, <laughs> send a ping. Um, uh, I'm interested. I think that's in so critically important. Go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say, I think it's critically important because, you know, everyone, and nobody's going to listen to a three hour. <laughs> How many people are going to listen to it all? You know, that's one thing. So then the question is, well, you know, this is where some of these chat box might be helpful. So you could, you could one, summarize it. Then you could ask questions uh, in a way that it could, it could answer the questions that you have rather than, you know, being in a simulation mode uh, constantly, but you're actually in inquiry mode. So I'd love to hear, see what you can do with that. Um, yeah. I I did that with the Thursday call, uh, two two Thursdays ago or something like that, and it, I was I was really amazed um, how an interactive, you know, interactive chat with the transcript uh, was. I got a lot more out of that than I I would reading a summary, um, and it it draws you in. You know, you want to find out more, and you you kind of slice and dice it in different ways, and it lets you grab lots of the meat of the conversation in a way that I, I couldn't do in any other way. It's really interesting. Mm. Um, I'm interested in, or maybe a different way to say it. Well, actually, I don't know. The, the thing that I need from Neo books is um, uh, a better under, a better, more, more project management, I guess. Um, so I would love to see, I think there are some things that, uh, the Neobooks team, whoever that is, whatever that is, uh, could be working on. Um, and I feel like, you know, for, for me, it might be something like define the, define the technical publishing process that turns a Google doc into a set of markdown pages, uh, into, you know, a website and into a PDF and into an ebook. Um, I would love to work on that project. Um, I might need help. Um, you know, we we've so we've been we've been flying by the seat of our pants. Um, we got through you know um, shepherding Klaus's book into existence at least. Um, I think if we were more deliberate about the kinds of things that I guess. So for me, it would end up being a kind of a list of things that we wish we could do. Um, and a lot of that would end up in a backlog. And then a few of those things would be on the active list, you know, so um, take the next step in defining the technical publishing process is an, a good, you know, project to be working on right now. Um, uh, defined, you know, define what we think we want about the market, how, how we want marketing to work, um, you know, um, so more of that, I would love more of that. And of course I can help set some of that up. So this page, which I think you've seen before, <clears throat> is my attempt to, for a place for that conversation and those resources. Um, I actually got a, a 404, which is, oh, it's because uh, you need to put the, I, you know, when I clicked on it, uh, the, the closing parenthesis falls off. So oh, that's weird. Cool. Does it work when you fix that? Yeah. Good. Cool. That's weird that it would fall off. Maybe it was yeah. not attached well. Uh, it's a bug in the way uh, Zoom chat parses URLs. Passes URLs. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> but this this was uh, an attempt. So the NeoBooks production plan, which is at this point an empty page. But that was that was the placeholder for what you're talking about in the sense of uh, actually mm -hmm. building a plan and doing something there. And and you and I had the beginnings of the conversation of how do we use massive to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'd love to do more of that. Um, uh, this is awesome. Uh, I would like to do more working from a list like this and adding stuff to it and pruning it and prioritizing it and whatever. Um, and you're in the, in the OGM wiki. So happy to follow your lead or happy to, you and I can use some of our time together to, to, to flesh this out. That'd, that'd be great. 
yeah, let's do that. Um, so one, one thing that, uh, <clears throat> just one thing in terms of um, I, I hearing two things, one is the sort of admin and development side of things, and then there is the actual doing it. And I think one thing that might generate interest is if, I don't know whether you want to do alternate or whatever, but have something where you invite people in and promote something that somebody is going to present. So for example, Jerry, if you were to do a, the first blog post on what the what you proposing Neobix to be, and we all sort of read that, you know, discussed it, used that conversation, you know, as a pre-publication thing, tweaked it and whatever, and then, you know, say, okay, Th these are little micro doses of things that can build up over time and it can be very, you know, uh, or even that article I just shared with you or anything where you're actually, um, you know, producing something yep. that is a, a small stepping stone. So something to think about. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I think I have a, a variant of Pete's ADD. So I, I get distracted all the time on the stuff that, <laughs> that, doesn't lead to like simple substantive uh, outputs like that. So I should sit down and do that. Uh, but now that we've well, got- I, I think, well, one thing I might ask you to do, which I think is just nice to hold you accountable to, okay, write this Substrat article, but whenever you want to sometime in the future, and I'll try and be there and I'll certainly read it beforehand and provide feedback and then, you know, take it. And, and I think that would actually- you know, there's a lot of, you know, if you're, if you, if you, as you well know, when you present something, you get so much more out of it. If you prepare for it in advance and whatever, it becomes a much more productive uh, session. So, and anyway. the good news is that we record these sessions so that if I present something, I can take that clip and then put it into the page later. And then I've got a multimedia experience, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you're muted. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rick, what do you think about doing a, like a review? If if Jerry, not to put a deadline, Jerry, but if you happen to write something by next Monday, what do you think, Rick, about putting twenty or thirty minutes on on the agenda for next week's meeting uh, just to go over that together? Which which one thing? Sorry, the um, a blog post about uh, what new books you know what Jerry wants out of new books, for instance. Oh, if he wants to, you're asking Jerry to present something next week. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah. then I'm asking. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Um, oh no, I no, that, exactly. No, that, I'm, I, I think it'd be great because I, I, I think you know having a generative input, but then take it to the larger group as well. And and you know, to me, it's a question of creating enthusiasm around something that people feel like you know. You know, enthusiasm is a great attractor. So if you can if you can harness the enthusiasm and people say, "Wow, this is cool," you know, then you know you draw people in. Jerry, I feel like another thing that we should do. Uh, you you mentioned the AI uh, hangout and build group. Um, uh, who has the the publishing press? Um. Uh, it it turned out that the group has less governance than it looked like it did, kind of, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is fine. Um, it's just coming together. But um, I I think there's an opportunity to um, to suggest um, uh, do do a show and tell with neobooks, I guess. Um, you know, for, so I was I was wondering whether or not to do that. I was like, <clears throat> I I was kind of holding back because I wanted to figure out what the group was like. Yeah, and I, it it wasn't the right time. There wasn't the right meeting. Yeah. Um. But uh, with the with the leader's recent emails, she's she's talking. She she. Um. So the the really cool thing is she's got lots of energy and passion. Yeah. Um, and then we generated a bunch of just you know suggestions, and then a lot of the kind of the her replies to those suggestions was like go for it guys do it um uh and there are things that don't make sense to do that way for like uh choosing a chat chat system was one of them uh, i had a bunch of suggestions but and and she said pete you, you should pick you've got a recommendation there and i i don't think i can i don't think it's the right thing for me to do group-wise mm -hmm. 
but I think it is the right thing for you or you and me or you and me and Rick. <laughs> um, uh, you don't have to join Rick. Uh, in, but anyway, to present uh, to to this group, you know, mm -hmm. hey, here's our thoughts on this process. Um, you know, can you help us write down more of the process as we help you, you know, execute that process? I think that would be a thing that they would be able to accept and a thing that would help uh, Neobooks too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a good idea. What, what is what is this group? Is it uh, is it part of the group or a separate group you're from? Completely to? separate. And and let me tell a little bit of a story um, around it since we've kind of since I brought we brought it back into the conversation. Um, I'm going to look at a at a note thing I have um, into the with all the excitement about generative AI. It's now kind of like a year year and a half later. Um, there are a bunch of people like me who are jumping in and trying to figure out what to do with these tools. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a marketplace? How do we teach other people how to use these tools? Right. Um, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so right now I'm in, uh, I'm in four groups <laughs> that are something somewhere between um, a, a mutual accountability groups and project teams and whatever. Um, and one of the groups actually last last week we had a great meeting where we kind of realized we don't know what we are we don't know if we're um, an accountability group or a project team or what and so let's actually start having a discussion of what that is right um, this this is yet another one of those um, so the idea of of the group that would I just mentioned um, it's called right now it doesn't really have a name that the, the the name on the uh, email thread is uh, AI, AI Hangout and Build. A couple of people got super energized and said, you know, there's so much, so much we know, so much demand for information, so many new tools that can help us write quickly and, and organize effectively. We should be doing this. We should be writing something. We should be writing a thing together and make a, you know, and, you know, and, and so then we all got together, uh, the, founder and the co-founder kind of uh you know got convened a call and she's like i've got a publishing press let's go let's write stuff and let's do it and so coming into that call it seemed like they had a lot of organization about what they wanted to do coming out of that call it seemed more like they had a lot of passion and energy and and they didn't know that that a bunch of us have you know, tools or have been thinking about processes or, you know, um, even for keeping together chatting or, or publishing or um, writing or whatever. So, um, so it's a group that needs help. It needs Neobook's help. Neobook could use it as, um, as energy to feed more writing because this group wants to write a whole bunch fast. What day is the meeting on? Uh, I don't think we have a next call set. Could... Was there a doodle yeah. sent? I forget. Yeah. Since I'm on four clock. of these, I have like, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea which meetings are where and oh, when yeah. and where we're uh, deciding what they are. And yeah. One of the four has uh, like six subgroups. Um, thankfully, I'm only in one or two of the subgroups right now, but. Yeah. Um, and we need an AI tool for organizing this, right? One of the the, the co-founder, uh, I'm going to be meeting with him Wednesday. Uh, he's like, Pete, I have a software engineer. We've got these GPTs. All we need to do is feed all the channels of information into the GPT and then have it organize, this, organize it and spit it back out. It, it makes a lot of sense, actually, when he says it. Um, so mm. I'm, I'm looking forward to that call. I'm and he yeah, said, I, I, and my, my engineer is, is an expert on Obsidian. He's kind of looking at this on an Obsidian basis. Oh, wow. I don't know if you know Obsidian. <laughs> and I'm like, as it turns out. So you're like, yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, okay. Any, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left in our normal appointed time. Anything else that makes sense to bring up now? Or shall we wrap our wrap this conversation? Um, to to so recap next. Just really quick. Yeah, mm -hmm. you want to yes. go first? To recap next steps, Jerry, you and I are going to do some project management hygiene around uh, Neobooks probably on Friday. Yep. 
um uh do you want so out of that call we could say hey the, the monday call we're going to be reviewing something or not yep do you want to pre-announce a review session <clears throat> before then or you don't know what you're going to be writing this week so it's actually just... also thanksgiving week yeah, yeah that's true which sort of actually means more time available um mm -hmm. And we've had we've held the OGM call on previous Thanksgivings, right? I, I think it's early enough in the day that I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking of going ahead with it this Thursday. There doesn't seem to be a good reason. There's a bunch of during pandemic, it was like a, an anti loneliness kind of thing, <laughs> which made which made a lot of sense. Right. Now now it's sort of interrupts yeah. Thanksgiving. But if somebody wants to show up, I'm happy to to sort of be there. You know, it's it's early enough on the West Coast that yeah, on the East Coast, not so much. <clears throat> um, Okay, and so I just put a link to the beginnings of this post, basically that I've been writing in Obsidian on the wiki, nice. um, mm -hmm. and and this is actually the intro to my neo book. So, <clears throat> so this is the nugget that would have multiple lives that I need to figure out exactly sort of how to tweak to make fit this context. But that but that that's where it's going. Thank you. Cool. So I think I can do more of this and talk about it. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable with doing that. And we're thinking that the best time, the best place to talk about it would be on the next NeoBooks call on Monday or one of our other calls. I think NeoBooks call. Cool. And Rick also kind of mentioned a, a async way to do that, maybe to, to involve more people. And I think that's smart too. Yep. But mm -hmm. maybe after the next call. Cool. That sounds great. Rick, you were going to say something. Yep. No, no, no. You, you you address the issues. No, I just want to look at it, and you know, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing how it evolves. Excellent. Me too. <laughs> thank you, uh, and thank you both. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now. Mm -hmm. Bye now.